Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome as we gather for another beautiful evening together with food and fellowship, and now we get a chance to rest in Jesus' words. So our order of service, as we've been doing through these weeks, will be up here on the screen, and let's begin with our opening sentences. Jesus Christ, the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Be our light and scatter the darkness, and hear our evening prayer and praise. And we pray, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. We, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our psalm for tonight is Psalm 4. It's entitled, O God, Be Gracious. Uh, you'll hear the, the melody play through one time and then we'll join in singing the verses. hear my prayer and answer when I cry. You give me hope in my distress. You will not pass me by. How long, O oh God, will liars boast while I am smeared with shame? Come set your faithful servant free, I call upon your name. When terror wakes me from my dreams and shakes me through and through, teach me to pray with confidence and trust my trust in you. Some fear that you will not provide. They cry, show us your face. But you have satisfied my heart with goodness, joy, and grace. Now lay me down to sleep in peace. In safety let me rest. O oh God, within your loving care, I am forever blessed. Grant peace to your people, Lord, that amid the stresses of life, we may rest quietly knowing all is right with you. Since your son has paid for every sin, defeated every enemy, and rules at the right hand of your throne in heaven. Let us fall asleep each night in peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Tonight we view the fourth section of our Passion History, the story of Jesus being arrested and Peter's denial, both fulfillment of the section that we heard last week where Jesus predicted exactly what would happen to him. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. Oh. 
They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers, with its commander and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood round a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple, where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a cock began to crow. <laughs> we'll continue with our next hymn, hymn number 525, The Lamb, verses 1 through 4. <laughs> The Lamb, the Lamb, oh 
Father, where's the sacrifice faith sees, believes? God will provide the Lamb of price. Worthy is the Lamb whose death makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. The Lamb, the Lamb, one perfect final offering. The Lamb, the Lamb, let earth join heaven his praise to sing. Worthy is the Lamb, whose death makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. The Lamb, the Lamb, as wayward sheep their shepherd kills so still, his will on our behalf the law to fill. Worthy is the Lamb whose death makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. He sighs, he dies, he takes my sin and wretchedness. He lives, forgives. He gives me his own righteousness. Worthy is the Lamb whose death makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. God's grace and his mercy and his peace are yours. The gift that he gives us, a gift that he covers us with every single day. God's word that we're going to focus on this evening are the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 14 and verses 20 to 25. And just so you note here, uh, the next day, the day before was Sunday, and that was Palm Sunday. So the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and then... After he rides into Jerusalem, he looks around, goes to the temple and looks around, and then he and his disciples go back to Bethany and spend time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then the next day, Monday morning, is when this takes place. The next day, after they had set out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. When he saw a fig tree and leaf in the distance, he went to see if he might find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, since it was not the season for figs. Jesus said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. As they passed by in the morning, so this is now the next day, they saw the fig tree withered down to its roots. Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus replied, have faith in God. Amen, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, everything that you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. As you think about the story that we heard, does it seem like that's in character for Jesus? It doesn't. And it's kind of a weird story, isn't it? You know, that Jesus curses a fig tree and then he starts talking about prayer. It just, it's, it's weird. But hopefully as we work our way through it, and when I fill in the hole in the middle of this story, it will make a little bit more sense. 
But you know, at this point in time, it seems like Jesus is cracking under the pressure. You know, like he's, he's kind of lost it and this fig tree just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and is the target of a divine temper tantrum. Do you have to realize Jesus had just been at the temple the evening before. And do you remember what he saw as he looks around? Yeah, he sees the animals and money changers. And all we're told is that he, he goes back to Bethany. But that's on his mind. And you can tell that he's frustrated. And maybe causing a fig tree to die is the smallest thing Jesus could have done that next morning. He probably could have taken all of his enemies, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and demolished them and left a crater where Jerusalem was. But instead, Jesus resists that temptation. And we know he must have been tempted because Satan doesn't give up. He tries every temptation, including, why did you just get rid of them all? But thankfully, our Savior is our perfect Savior. The writer to the Hebrews, when he describes this great high priest we have, says, He is not one who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but he has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So where we, we might have destroyed our enemies in a fit of divine rage, Jesus did not. He was perfect. But why then did Jesus curse the fig tree? Especially as he's walking toward it and he already knows what's going to happen. He knows that there's no figs there. So why in the world would he curse it? In fact, Mark said it wasn't even the season for figs. Jesus finds the leaves, no figs. And then he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Anybody here like figs? Yeah, me too. Figs are fantastic. And I, I recently read an article in the Smithsonian Magazine that was an incredible overview of, of figs. Figs are one of the most ancient fruits that still exist today. And they are a, a staple in the Middle East. And there are all kinds of figs. They're not just one kind of fig. I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. A fig tree in an orchard is usually about 10 to 15 feet tall. It can grow up to 25 feet tall. It is the center of the economy in the, in the Middle East. And for good reason, because a fig tree could have two, maybe even three crops every single year. In December, a fig tree will drop its leaves. And then in March, it will begin to bud again. And before the leaves are even fully formed, the figs are already starting to form underneath the leaf bunches. So when Jesus walked up to this tree, he fully expected that if he looks underneath the leaves, he's going to find figs because they will at least be developing, even if they're not ready to eat. But Jesus found nothing. And so he cursed it. He cursed it so completely and thoroughly that the next morning when the disciples walked by, they noticed that something had happened to the tree. They saw it withered down to the roots. Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, that fig tree that you cursed has withered. What's Jesus trying to say? At the very least, he's, he could be saying, you know, look what happens when you don't do the things God has called you to do. You know, the writer to the Hebrews says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's true. Jesus carries and wields that kind of power, the power to judge. That was one of the reasons to warn about the danger of unfruitfulness, but that was just one tree. And Mark did say that Jesus was hungry. So maybe that's the reason why he cursed it. But Jesus has dealt with hunger before, hasn't he? You know, 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. So he knows how to deal with hunger. So that's not the reason why he cursed it. It wasn't because he was angry and his stomach was growling and he wanted something to eat. No, he had a purpose. And we catch some of that purpose with these words from Mark. And his disciples were listening. 
Jesus was going to teach them something. You might call it his disciples' message or his object lesson, or some have even called this Jesus' living parable, where he tries to teach them something with an earthly element right in front of them, and he's giving them some sort of heavenly meaning. Right after Jesus cursed the fig tree, we skipped some verses. In those verses in between is when he goes into the temple. And that's when he cleaned out God's house. Right? He gets rid of the animals, drives out the money changers, turns over their tables. He's looking for fruit. And what does he find? You know, as he's looking around, maybe the words of Hosea are echoing in his ears. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Jesus came into the temple looking for fruit, the fruits of faith. And instead, all he found was a den of thieves and robbers. He was standing in one of the architectural wonders of the world, a beautiful building. Everything looked good on the outside. Animals are being sold for sacrifice, money exchanged to pay the temple tax, sacrifices taking place. Everything looked as it should. But the people's hearts, the hearts of many of them, were not with the true God. They were more concerned about outward appearances than they were about their hearts. So just as Jesus cleaned out the temple, he cursed a fig tree. He cursed it so that he might drive home the truth of the parable he had taught his disciples earlier in his ministry, a very similar story. He said, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it. Sound familiar? But he did not find any. So he said to the gardener, look, for three years now, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I have found none. Cut it down. Why even let it use up the soil? But the gardener replied to him, Sir, leave it alone just this year until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. Do you think Jesus was issuing a warning to all the fig trees in Palestine? Oh, you better, you better bear fruit. You better have some good figs. Who was he talking to? His disciples and to us. He wants fruit. He doesn't want to look and find nothing. So how do you find good fruit? You know, when you go to the store, what are some things you do in order to pick out good fruit? Smell it. Okay, you smell it. You use the sense of smell and you smell, ooh, that smells ripe or that doesn't smell ripe, or ooh, that smells overripe. Okay, so you use your sense of smell. What else might you use? Feel it. Yeah, you touch it. And, and maybe you even give it a little squeeze, right? Just very gentle. And if there's a little give, then you know, okay, it's getting ripe. Or you know, ooh, that's not getting ripe, or ooh, that's way too soft. So we've got smell, we've got touch, and use your eyes, right? You look at it and you see, does it have spots? Does it look the right color? You know, should blueberries be green? Probably, probably not. Or strawberries be yellow? Probably not. So you use those senses and, and then you make your choices and you take it home. Are you guaranteed that the fruit that you chose will be good? Well, why not? Why? But you checked it. You looked at it, you smelled it, you gave it the squeeze. Okay, you can't tell the future, even more specific, you can't tell what's on the inside. Yeah. One of my favorite fruits are peaches. And I hate buying peaches. I'd rather, you know, if I can pick them, fantastic, but if I have to buy them, because they look wonderful, they smell wonderful, they're soft, and you cut them open and they're brown and mushy. You can't tell what it's like on the inside. Do you think God has that problem when he looks at our fruit? 
He can tell exactly what it's like. He can look at it and see, oh, what they're doing is good. He can smell it. Oh, that's, that, that activity smells really good. Look at what they're doing. Or he can kind of touch it and see, oh, boy, that's, that's doing well. But you know, if, if the things that we're doing are only about ourselves or about looking good for God and saying, you know, God, look at all the stuff that I do. Guess what kind of fruit that is? It's rotten or it's not even there because it's not that gift from the heart. Right? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He wants our hearts. And when our hearts are in the right place, when they put him first and honor and love him above all things, then everything else we do flows from hearts of faith and love. And God sees that and he says, oh, that's wonderful fruit. It's perfect because you did it for me. Jesus was looking for fruit and he, he uses this fig tree to show us he wants to find that good fruit in our lives. There was one other reason why Jesus' final steps led to this fig tree. And it, it's kind of interesting how this conversation goes. You know, it's Tuesday morning. The disciples have seen the tree. Peter says, Rabbi, look what happened. The fig tree that you cursed has withered. And now Jesus has this super logical response. Have faith in God. What does that have to do with the fig tree? And it withering. And he goes on to say, have faith in God. Amen, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, everything that you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. What's the connection with the fig tree? Who did Jesus ask? to make that fig tree wither. He asked God. And he was confident that God had heard him and God had answered him. What happened to the fig tree? It withered. Does prayer work? Oh yeah. So not only is Jesus looking for fruit in our lives, but he also wants us to understand that prayer works. A couple decades later, his, his, his uh, stepbrother James would say this, the prayer of a righteous person is, is powerful and effective. And then he uses the example of the prophet Elijah. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land produced its harvest. So does prayer work? Yes. Jesus said it. God's word says it. The example of our fellow believers says it. It works. And yet, how often don't we sometimes wonder, does it? We bring mountains before God sometimes and lay them at his feet and say, Lord, would you move these things for me? Move the cancer. Move my grief. Move my marriage where I want it to be. Move my family and my kids to do what you want them to do. Lord, move these mountains. And we hear crickets. And we wait for his answers. And sometimes it even seems like he says no. Well then, where is he? He says he'll listen. He says he'll answer. And you're right, Stevie, he's with us, right? He, he's there. He, when he says he will hear and he will answer, he will keep that promise. The only problem for us is sometimes he says no. And that hurts, right? Because none of us likes to hear no. You know, how, how many times did our children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews like to hear the word no and they say, can I have a candy bar? Can I have cake? Can I have cookies? No. Oh. But when God's no comes, he guarantees that it will be for our good. Just think of what happened with the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he talks about asking God three times to take away this 
thorn in his flesh, some physical ailment that he was dealing with. Lord, take it away, please, no. Take it away, please, no. Take it away, please, no. Three times God said no. And then God told him this. My grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. Because my power is made perfect in weakness. And what was Paul's response? He said, well, then I'll boast in my weakness because then the power of Christ will show itself in me. God would use his no for Paul's benefit, even though Paul would say, no, I, I don't think so. God would use it for his benefit. So we pray. And we pray that we might move mountains. You know, that's a, that's a big request, isn't it? If, if we actually prayed, you know, the Mesa here moved even an inch, you think that would show up on YouTube and TikTok and Facebook and there'd be, you know, it'd go viral and there'd be aval avalanches of likes and shares. It would, wouldn't it? But Jesus wasn't looking for that kind of mountain moving. He knew that his disciples needed to focus not on having their head, heads in the clouds or performing these earth-shattering miracles. They had other mountains to take care of. And that's why he finished by saying, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. But if you do not forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is a big mountain. What makes it so hard sometimes to forgive? Hurt feelings. Okay, there's one. Pride. pride yeah, pride, definitely. <laughs> Anything else? Resentment. Shame. Shame. Yeah. And all of those things conspire to keep us from praying to move that mountain. Right? We see the person, we know what Jesus says, we know we should forgive them, but they hurt us, or they don't deserve it, or they aren't sorry enough, or we're too ashamed to say anything, and then we, we just can't do it. And Jesus says, when you ask, God can move that mountain. And God will move that mountain. Because that's where his steps are taking him this entire week. Jesus' final steps have taken him to a tomb. Right? The tomb of his friend Lazarus. And there he proved his power over death itself. Then we had his final steps take us to Bethany where he was, attended that dinner celebration at Simon the leper's house and how he spent time with these people and, and Mary brought this beautiful gift and anointed him for his burial. Jesus wasn't afraid to receive that and say, yeah, this is for me, it's coming soon. And then his, his final steps led to the, to the temple where he cleansed it and, and made it once again a house of prayer and a praise for his father. And now his steps take us to a, a fig tree where he reminds us to produce fruit and to pray with, without ceasing, to pray powerfully and, and faithfully and trusting. So we move these mountains. Jesus kept going until he came to his own mountain, right? The one outside Jerusalem with a cross on top where he would suffer and then die so that he might move the mountain of our sin and the mountain of everyone's sin, so that the whole world can find forgiveness, so that we can forgive just as we have been forgiven. So the next time you think about this story, or maybe walk past a tree that looks remotely like a fig tree, just stop and think, oh yeah, Jesus went to that tree for me to show me what it means to produce fruit, to show me what it means to pray in faith and trust, and to know that he can move all those mountains for me. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, I pray that will cover your hearts and minds now and always. Amen. All right, at this time, we'll continue with our offering.
Let's join together in praying Luther's evening prayer, followed by singing the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins, and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. For our closing hymn tonight, we'll join in the final three verses of our hymn, hymn number 783, Abide With Me. every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power, who like thyself my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine, O oh, abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Hills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me.